Good afternoon. My name is Dan Lips, and I'm the Director of Cyber and National Security at the Lincoln Network. Welcome to our webinar, Protect 2020, Securing the Election Ahead of November. Thank you for taking time out of your day to join us. At the Lincoln Network, our mission is to connect the technology and policy communities to make the future happen sooner and to build a better tomorrow. To advance this mission, our cyber and national security team works to inform national policy discussions with technical expertise drawn from Silicon Valley and other tech hubs to develop and advance solutions to key national challenges. In 2020, one of the biggest national challenges we face is to hold a national, challenge, or national election during the COVID-19 pandemic. Today, we are honored to host leading experts from the national and intergovernmental community that administers our nation's elections and protects state and local government information systems. First, we'll hear a presentation from Jeffrey Hale, the Director of the Election Security Initiative at the Department of Homeland Security. His presentation will uh, be followed by a discussion, uh, including questions from the audience. For all of you joining us, please feel free to use the chat function here in Zoom to ask questions. After that, the second half of our program will feature a discussion with representatives of associations of state government leaders. Lindsay Forson, the Cybersecurity Program Manager with the National Association of Secretaries of State, and Maggie Brunner, a, policy, a Program Director for Homeland Security and Public Safety at the National Governors Association. First, it's really terrific to have an opportunity to hear from Jeffrey and the Department of Homeland Security. Since the summer of 2016, DHS has been leading a national nonpartisan initiative to support state and local governments in securing their election systems, which are a part of the nation's critical infrastructure. Jeff is the director of the department's election security initiative and a senior official at the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, or CISA, at the department. The election security initiative is a DHS led interagency body charged with coordinating federal support to the election infrastructure community. Jeff is a certified information systems manager and experienced cyber operations planner. Uh, he, holds, uh, he is a graduate of the University of Virginia and earned his master's degree in systems engineering for George Washington University. Jeff, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Um, good afternoon, all. Uh, I'm here in Arlington, Virginia, where the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency is located. Uh, we have were previously known as uh, NPPD, uh, the National Protections and Programs Directorate, and and that that name didn't really tell anyone what our job was. But but back in 2016, it's been quite a journey to go from NPPD uh, and emerging in our work in election security uh, till today. Um, I'd have to say that in 2016, we were uh, certainly caught off guard. We hadn't made the same inroads. Uh, with the election community that we have, that we focused on over the last four years, uh, working with individuals uh, at, at the National Association of Secretaries of State, at the National Association of State Election Directors, uh, and the National Governors Association. Uh, over that time, we've, we've really focused on refining our mission, which uh, to us is to provide risk management advice to election stakeholders. Uh, so we focus on uh, helping election stakeholders to identify and then detect, manage and mitigate risk to their, uh, to their respective systems. And then it's important to recognize that, that we see uh, the election stakeholders as encompassing not only the election officials that manage uh, voting systems and voter registration databases and the vendors that support them uh, or that, that community that we call election infrastructure, but we also engage with partisan organizations, campaigns uh, and the electorate as our third line of effort. Uh, we structure our work accordingly. Uh, we, in early 2017, uh, our support to, uh, to election infrastructure uh, was more formalized by declaring that sector part of critical infrastructure. Uh, now, in all candor, uh, we could do a lot better of a job of explaining what that meant, but uh, because it wasn't very a popular decision at the time, and I hope over the course of the years that they've seen that DHS's presence, that, that um, that the cybersecurity and infrastructure securities uh, present in uh, election security is really a supporting function, helping to provide the information and vulnerability management services to help those, uh, those stakeholders manage risks that are to their systems. Um, over the, to do so, we've tried to establish an information sharing environment, uh, really focused around 
the EIISAC, or the Election Infrastructure Information Sharing and Analysis Center. Uh, it, uh, the, it was stood up in 2018, uh, and then since that time has expanded to all 50 states, um, has, uh, has more than 200 or 2,500 local jurisdictions. Uh, they've deployed intrusion detection sensors for the purpose of helping to understand uh, what type of traffic is targeting election infrastructure across the states. So it's really been um, a, a rapid evolution of the, of the information sharing uh, of the c communal defense uh, in this sector. Um, we've, we've been able to take some of the best practices learned from doing this type of support for other critical infrastructure sectors and apply it to uh, our support to election infrastructure. Uh, that's a little different when we start to talk about our second line of effort, supporting those partisan organizations, campaigns, uh, and the uh, party committees, which we have the same vulnerability management services, but they represent such a different use of infrastructure. Often it's entirely uh, managed service providers or, or distributed systems uh, in, uh, with no central security uh, service. So, uh, so it is very much about the hygiene practices of the individuals of, or of security awareness of understanding threats and vulnerabilities at that, as opposed to the harder operational technologies of election infrastructure. Our third line of effort is really that, that stakeholder group, uh, the electorate. And, and then how do we help them to recognize the risk of them being targeted and their critical role in election security? So uh, we have, uh, we kind of think of it as uh, the FBI, the intelligence community focuses on uh, stopping bad actors from producing mis and disinformation and, and really targeting the public. And we focus on the other side of that equation, trying to make the electorate a more resilient electorate uh, to the, the activities of malicious actors uh, so that they can recognize the risk of information operations so that they can uh, be more critical consumers of information uh, and, and, uh, and manage risks uh, of information operations that way. Uh, we had a successful launch uh, about this time last year of uh, trying to explain the tactics and techniques of information campaigns. We called it the war on pineapple. It used the, design, the divisive issue of pineapple on pizza uh, to explore the steps that nation state adversaries go through in establishing an information operations campaign. And so we were very pleased with that uptick. It actually became, the pineapple became a bit of a mascot for our agency. Uh, and we've recently produced uh, a series of uh, additional products um, that are focusing on uh, individual steps one can take to reduce their exposure uh, and the likelihood of sharing and spreading disinformation on any particular topic, not just elections. I want to thank you guys for having me and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Jeffrey. One question that I know is on everyone's mind is, um, how the, the current situation that we're living in with this pandemic, changing the, the challenge that you face at CISA and the nation faces in terms of preparing for holding an election during these you know, very unique circumstances? So uh, certainly as if 2020 wasn't going to be challenging enough, well, we had to throw in a pandemic in there. Uh, but our job at CISA is really to support uh, the states in their decisions on how to manage elections. Uh, so. Uh, some have uh, have expanded the use of mail-in voting. Others are, are making decisions to centralize voting locations uh, and operate. We've seen the pandemic apply pressure in certain areas. Uh, the willingness of some poll workers to work. Oftentimes, there's a large overlap of individuals uh, in um, many poll workers are uh, at an age that is particularly susceptible to the virus. Uh, so in taking steps for them to, to have the appropriate operational support to run and manage and administer an election uh, while still maintaining the health and safety uh, of the community. We've been able to work with the US Election Assistance Commission to work with uh, election officials on our government coordinating council uh, and other vendors in the sector coordinating council to produce a, a series of best practices for both in-person voting uh, under this, these conditions and an expansion of mail-in voting. We don't view mail-in voting as riskier by any means than in-person voting, 
uh, but, but it does shift the particular infrastructure systems that are being used. Now you have different ballot printers, you have mail sorters, you have, and, it, and the amount of those systems are used uh, is essential to understand as you try to manage and mitigate risks to your system. In terms of the, uh, the, the confidence of the voting public, absentee balloting has been around for quite some time, um, but now we're moving to this really unique circumstance with you potentially uh, a majority of people using these systems, which many are not you know, fully confident uh, in uh, or having past experience using. Um, well, how does that affect the, the, the trust in the election and the, the potential risk for adversaries to uh, potentially exploit that lack of knowledge? So certainly communicating any changes with the electorate to the voting administrative process, uh, to what they're, they can expect in a mail, an increased mail scenario, um, that's essential. One of our guidance documents really supports this and talks through the different mechanisms and types of things to communicate to the public because much like security awareness is essential for a good security program, just voting awareness uh, and, and the way this shifts um, some of the, uh, the administrative expectations is essential uh, to commute for election officials to communicate with their stakeholders. Um, we, uh, as you said, uh, some states have been doing all mail elections since 2000. Uh, I believe the Brennan Center cited uh, that in 2018, more than a quarter of ballots returned were, were by mail. So uh, I, there is uh, in pockets across the country, very strong familiarity with the process and security of these uh, mail-in approach, but educating the rest of the country on how that is administered uh, under a short timeline is essential. Another question that I have is, how has the cybersecurity risk uh, landscape changed over the past four years? Uh, I recall when Secretary Johnson uh, first initiated the um, public announcements in August of 2016 about uh, these potential threats. How do you see the, the landscape evolving, uh, particularly in the past year? We've seen a lot of ransomware attacks. Where do you see the biggest risks to uh, cyber election infrastructure? So certainly anything that's connected to the internet um, is going to face that low level cyber activity that you see all, all the time. Um, we have seen an evolution of the information sharing across the sector uh, from one that didn't really exist as, as a unified security community to one that has fully embraced um, not even just incident reporting, but activity reporting. And this type of awareness uh, increases um, the confidence that we have that, that we can detect every tremor uh, uh, affecting the, the election infrastructure sector. Uh, whereas in 2018, uh, we didn't even know uh, who the state, chief, the state chief election officer was in each state. So this has been an evolution as a national security community uh, that, that didn't exist prior to 2016. In the chat here, we have a question um, from Eric Geller. Would it make your job easier to have a strong, clear warning from NAS about internet voting echoing your warning? Um, I've been very pleased by the response to, uh, to our uh, risk management guidance for uh, electronic ballot uh, delivery, marking, and return. Uh, and and the, the short of it is, is that there, there are uses that can um, expedite the process of getting a ballot out to, to necessary communities, but we highly recommend returning a paper ballot um, and not using electronic return uh, because we do not see those risks as being manageable uh, by current technology. Um, I don't have any expectation for uh, the, the statement to be, um, uh, to, to be echoed by anyone else. We had EAC, NIST, and the FBI co-author, uh, and uh, the purpose of that document is uh, for communities like NASS and NASA, they are consumers and they can do with that, that what, they, what they want. We've been very thrilled with their partnership. Another question that's been shared with me involves some of the experience that we're seeing with uh, primaries that have occurred over the past few months. In some states and cities, there have been reports of long lines, voters waiting hours, up to five hours in, to, to be able to vote. When you're you know, talking with the election directors and the stakeholders, what has been your view and CISA's view about that, that challenge, um, security-related risks, thinking also 
about uh, CISA's mission, looking at protecting you know, physical security. What are you learning? So uh, honestly, this is a fascinating space where I think we've gotten to the point uh, that in many cases, operational risk, the ability to, to operate the election, to conduct the election uh, is superseding uh, what I've focused on for the last four years is cyber risk and infrastructure risk. Um, there is a need for more and healthy poll workers. Uh, some estimates say a million more poll workers are needed to conduct the election in, in November. Uh, there's a need for certainty around polling locations. Uh, and then uh, once you have those types of resources uh, available, uh, you can use operations research to plan out uh, how long your lines are going to be. But, but frankly, uh, in, the, in some recent elections and in forthcoming elections, when you are centralizing uh, voting locations, voting centers uh, in this manner, um, it's going to end up with long lines if, you're not, if you don't have the other resources uh, to check people in to get them their appropriate ballot, to, to usher them through. Uh, and honestly, that operational element uh, is one of the areas where election officials need the support of Americans as much as anything else. Since some of our attendees today may be um, new to, to learning about CISA, can you talk some more about you know, the various services that are provided to state and local governments, including the Albert Center program, how has that been received and what's the prospect of uh, utilize, utilization of that type of a tool and other tools that CIS has been developing over the next five months? So absolutely. Uh, the Cybersecurity and Infra Infrastructure Security Agency uh, supports the uh, security of critical infrastructure partners and the federal government um, uh, for more than just the election infrastructure sector. So we've taken best practices uh, that we've learned across support to the financial sector, support to the chemical sector, and tried to apply them here. Uh, all of the services that, that existed once, we, once this community stood up, these are things like vulnerability scanning, um, risk and vulnerability assessments, uh, penetration testing. Uh, we've evolved some of these to allow more scalable uh, remote activities, uh, so remote penetration testing, which has been essential considering uh, that we're all, all operating in a, uh, a remote uh, dispersed environment during this pandemic. Um, so a lot of the vulnerability management activities uh, are how we start to understand what's really impacting the sector and, and where we can make the most gains. Uh, we focus on identifying trends across those findings and producing trainings, exercising with them. We've done uh, three national level exercises uh, for uh, the election infrastructure community. Uh, we, we also do uh, individual state or vendor exercises. The national exercises have had more than 44 states in each instance. Uh, in some cases, thousands of locals participating from their, uh, from their state, from their location. Uh, and those are about how to identify cyber incidents, how to, how to detect, uh, how to report them appropriately, how to get the federal government involved, how to get their chief election officials involved uh, so that nothing goes unnoticed in this sector. Um, these are the type of things that, that we've, over the course of time, been able to evolve from a 101 understanding of how to protect uh, election infrastructure, how to something far more mature where we get a, a more robust understanding of the activities, the needs of this community. At the Lincoln Network, we have a, a a community of technologists, many are patriots and interested in finding ways to make a contribution and to help you know, support improving the security of our election systems. Uh, can you talk to some of the ways that uh, the DHS and CISA you know, works with the technology community, um, open source communities? So um, while I described the three stakeholder groups uh, that, that we support, what's been essential to be uh, underlying all of that has been a network of um, technologists, of, of the intelligence community, uh, of threat vendors, of cybersecurity experts uh, to provide an indicator and warning framework to, to inform our warning and response across all of this. And, and so it isn't just an activity where CISA has evolved its understanding. It's we've been able to take our particular expertise connected to the, the intelligence community. We've been able to take uh, threat vendors, particular insight, uh, and inform uh, the the state's commute, uh, the the state's particular threat awareness, uh, and so uh, really being able to have a collective de defense mentality 
and bring these communities together for uh, the benefit of this sector has been essential. Uh, it is something that didn't exist in 2016, didn't really exist in 2017. Uh, in 2018, uh, our director gave us the charge to, uh, to improve warning and response, uh, particularly for this community, and, and there's been a collective response. To your um, example of pineapple pizza and being very, um, looking at issues that are divisive, at the highest level of national politics right now, the issue of absentee voting and voting by mail is becoming um, very divisive. Um, and it's uh, at the front and center of the current uh, presidential campaign. Can you talk a little bit about how you, how or whether you see your foreign adversaries possibly exploiting that division what the public can can do about it? It is important to uh, to support uh, election officials in their decisions on how to administer elections and to help them uh, amplify their voice of the uh, the particular decisions they made. If there is an expansion of vote by mail, what are the deadlines for vote by mail? How does it that impact election night reporting? Uh, how do we pre bunk? Uh, any of the, the the necessary and critical information out there to the electorate uh, so that the appetite for misinformation in this space is reduced. Uh, so this is why we work very closely with NAS and NASED uh, with local election officials uh, to help amplify the, the true, the, the, the trusted voices in this community, um, uh, particularly through NASA's Trusted Voices Initiative, um, in order to, to uh, ensure that uh, the correct voice is loudest here. Thank you. We have a question here from the audience from Jennifer Fernick. What are the open questions that most need additional technical research to help resolve? What kind of studies, tools, guidance, documents, or other resources from the industrial research community would be most helpful to improve election security? Oh, wow. Hey, that's a great question. Uh, one of the areas that I think the next decade of election security will be defined by is the efficiency and effectiveness of post-election audits. We've been very big about the, the need for um, currently paper uh, in order to provide the auditability for this sector, uh, but there's a lot of efficiencies to be gained in the ability to conduct those audits uh, in a way that is less time intensive, less resource intensive, uh, and helps to provide the statistical certainty uh, that the election uh, is counted the way it should be. Have you seen a, a good pickup of those types of auditing practices over the past several years? Absolutely. So uh, I believe a recent estimate is that 92% uh, of voters will have a, uh, will cast a vote on a, an auditable record. That doesn't mean that they will all be audited, uh, but over the last few years, uh, particularly at the jurisdiction level, uh, many of the counties, many jurisdictions are taking up practicing risk limiting audits other, uh, or other post-election audit tools in order to be, uh, in order to drive that certainty. There's another question here in the Q&A um, from Peter Gisela. Um, during the primaries, what attempts, patterns of intrusions have been blocked? Did you release public info on that type of um, threat and who was doing it? So uh, we see a lot of the typical internet behavior. I mean, one of the interesting things was um, the amount of web application scanning, of, uh, of uh, attempts at, at SQL injections, of, of things just blocked by web application firewalls uh, that occurs every day, either because Secretary of State Networks uh, host election infrastructure or there are other, uh, some of them have, um, uh, have other business responsibilities that are also valuable, high value assets uh, for potential nation state targets. So um, this has been one where our understanding of what affects the community uh, has increased a, a thousand fold. And yes, we do, uh, this is why we set up uh, an ISAC and the Election Infrastructure Informa Information Sharing and Analysis Center so that the signatures from that type of behavior uh, are both investigated, but also distributed across this sector and other critical infrastructure sectors. We use our automated indicator sharing. Uh, that's obviously a, a tool that's available through a lot of threat platforms, through a lot of indicator and information sharing platforms uh, to, uh, to the whole of the community. As we approach November, I'd like to know, you know what's the biggest risks that you're concerned about? 2020 has already been a pretty um, incredible year. 
uh, what are, what can we expect to see um, and you know, what are you all preparing for that we, that may not be on our radar? So before February, March, I had one answer, um, but before, and, and I'll give you that one first. That's, um, this is such an asymmetric advantage to our, our adversaries. They don't have to touch a system at all uh, in order to see where there were problems and then claim that, that they had some type of cyber behavior, spreading disinformation, undermining the confidence in those institutions uh, just through other operational facts. Now, uh, as I alluded to earlier, uh, the operational risk for a lot of, um, uh, for a lot of the, our, our election officials is as high as, as ever. The ability to, to have the appropriate amount of staff of poll workers to support their ability to conduct an election um, is higher than ever. We're almost at the, at the bottom of the hour, so I'd love to um, bring in our other guests for this discussion. Um, Jeff, you've provided a really helpful background um, on the, the national view. Let's turn to the state's perspectives. Uh, elections, of course, are administered at the state and local level. Uh, in many states, the Secretary of State is the chief official responsible for overseeing the elections. And, and while governors are not responsible for administering elections, they play a critical role in leading state efforts to protect information systems and critical infrastructure. Uh, so with that, we're, we're really thrilled to have experts from the National Association of Secretaries of States and the National Governors Association joining us here today. And we're also grateful for you, Jeff, that you're uh, willing to stick around for this, uh, the rest of this discussion. Uh, Lindsay Forsen is the Cyber Program Manager at the National Association of Secretaries of State, or NAS. Uh, founded in 1904, NAS is the nation's oldest nonpartisan professional organization for public officials. Lindsay manages the association's relationships related to cybersecurity and election security facilitates cybersecurity information sharing among NASA's members and their IT staff and staffs the NAS Cybersecurity Committee. She has a master's degree in public administration from Auburn University and is a doctoral candidate in Auburn, uh, Auburn's graduate program in public administration and public policy. Thank you for joining us, Lindsay. Um, we're also joined by uh, Maggie Brunner, uh, who serves as a program director for Homeland Security and Public Safety at the National's Governors Association. NGA is the voice of the leaders of the 55 states, territories, and commonwealths. Maggie focuses on cybersecurity policy, homeland security, emergency communications, and public safety technology. Maggie holds a JD from William and Mary Law School and a bachelor's degree in history from Tufts University. Uh, thank you, Maggie, for joining us. Lindsay and Maggie, could you share some opening remarks about your perspective representing NAS and NGA? Certainly. Um, I'll, I'll start us off. Um, thanks for having me today, Dan, and um, thanks for joining us, Maggie and Jeff. As Dan said, my name is Lindsay Forson. I'm the Cybersecurity Program Manager at the National Association of Secretaries of State. NAS represents Secretaries of State and some Lieutenant Governors throughout the country. And as Dan said, 40 of our members serve as their state's Chief Election Official. That role, role varies a bit from state to state, but all of them are involved in the voter registration process overseeing the statewide voter registration system, working with their local election officials on election administration in different ways. Um, I, was, I started with NAS about two years ago. Uh, I'm focused on cybersecurity for, with the secretaries for really every aspect of their job. As Jeff said, the secretaries um, they oversee election administration and voter registration, but many of them have other roles as well in business services, state archives, and a range of different things. Some of them, a couple of them have DMV. Um, that there are a range of responsibilities that the secretaries are responsible for, and they take cybersecurity seriously for every single el element of their job and all of the data that they collect and protect. Um, one of our main roles, what, what we see as our main role at NAS is really to facilitate sh the sharing of information and the sharing of ideas and practices across the 50 states. We, um, we hold conferences, we hold regular calls, regular meetings with both the secretaries and members of their staff. One of the major things I do in my role at NAS is facilitate information sharing among the IT directors, uh, CIOs and CISOs in the secretary's office on a regular basis. 
through a variety of mechanisms. Um, we hold two, two tech talk sessions just about every year where we get those folks in a room and allow them to share ideas, share challenging questions they're facing and see what the other states are doing on those things. So really that's what we see as our major role, helping the states each to improve their individual practices by getting ideas from what the other states are already doing well and also to be the facilitator of information sharing with the federal government. CISA, as Jeff said, we've had a great partnership between CISA and the secretaries through NAS and, and as well as with other federal agencies, other nonprofit organizations, NAS kind of sees ourselves as a mechanism between the secretaries and those organizations to help information go back and forth. Perfect, thank you. Maggie? Yeah, thanks so much, Dan. First off, thanks to the Lincoln Networks and the, and the invitation, we really appreciate it. Um, as you mentioned, my name is Maggie Brunner, Program Director for Cybersecurity at NGA. I sit within the NGA Center for Best Practices, so you know we don't lobby. We are a subsidiary 501c3 that's really dedicated to being sort of a clearinghouse for um, some of the promising practices that states are employing. So um, you know we are responsible in that capacity for um, pulling together a network of state cybersecurity leaders, whether that be the state CIOs, CISOs, Homeland Security Advisors, National Guard, folks from Fusion Center, um, really, I think everybody in the state role who is kind of focused from the governor's level on trying to improve the overall security posture of the state. So, you know, as you uh, carefully mentioned, of course, you know, it's uh, Lindsay's folks who are really the infrastructure owners here. Um, and, you know, in many states, of course, uh, governors are constitutionally separate from their secretaries of state just because they run. Uh, that makes a lot of sense, but when it comes to security, we really like to figure out in what ways we can be allies because since the CI designation, it's really important that we kind of muster every single resource at the state. So what are, what are some ways I think that states can really help improve this if they're tackling cybersecurity holistically and doing programs from state to local? Um, there's a lot of overlap between just regular cybersecurity and election security as well. Thank you. Earlier, Jeff mentioned that he had one view about the risks that we faced in uh, administering elections back before the pandemic. Um, how is, has the perspective of the and the challenge facing both the secretaries of state and the governors changed over the past three months with this really unprecedented challenge in the pandemic? You know, each as as Jeff discussed, elections are extremely decentralized in our country and we have very different election administration systems, infrastructure, policies, practices across the 50 states and even in many cases within the 50 states. So it's been really important for states and even localities to do individual risk assessments to look at their assets and, and determine where they need to prioritize resources to manage risk. Um, and, and they continue to do that. So. COVID-19 has, has made it necessary that states and localities reassess risk as operations may be expanding or shifting. Um, a lot of the, you know, the systems that we talk about a lot that are priority areas for protection, um, as those ones that are internet connected and they have to be internet connected by the nature of what they are, web applications, as Jeff mentioned, where um, voters can go find their polling place or a ballot drop box or um, online um, registering to vote online, requesting an absentee ballot online. All of those systems were really priority areas before the pandemic. And, you know, the way that voting processes may be shifting, they, they're probably only going to become even more of a priority area um, as, as, you know, vote by mail may be expanding. It's only that much more important that we protect the integrity of voter registration data, for example. As um, more people want to request absentee ballots, it's only more important that they're able to, they have the availability to go request that absentee ballot online if that's what a state does. But it's going to individually come down to the state's practices, their systems, and what they are doing. So they're just continuing to assess risk and manage risk. And as their operations change, that, that may shift those risk calculations. One thing that nobody expected 
was the rapid shift to remote work that had to happen. Um, and so that, that in certainly introduced some new risks, some new technology, new processes, some people connecting remotely that weren't previously connecting remotely. And so that, that added uh, an additional thing that a lot of states had to do. And also that the states, a big part of their role in election security is assisting their locals with cybersecurity. And so um, in the, there are more than 8,000 local election jurisdictions across the United States that all play a role in this. So states have launched programs like cyber navigator programs, for example, where they have state staff that goes out and helps their locals do risk assessments and prioritize the top five things they can do to best manage risk. And so through those cyber navigator programs and other existing mechanisms, the states already had in place, they were able to help their locals facilitate that shift to remote work while protecting the systems that they were connecting with. And just to add to that, Dan, I think for our members specifically, um, it feels very different now. So, you know, due to this pandemic, governors are increasingly being asked to use their executive authority to directly sort of work around elections administration to an unprecedented level for us. So we have seen in some natural disasters, like in Hurricane Sandy, for example, governors have been asked to use their executive authority, or, you know, we've looked at what that entails, if there's a state emergency declaration, um, you know, NCSL has a whole project sort of mapping this, but this is the first time in our nation's history that every single state and territory has been under emergency declaration at the same time. So it, it, it's, it's very different. Right now our members, are, I think, are being asked really different difficult um, novel questions like what if they use their executive power to close something like a school and that's a polling location? Um, what is their role in closing the poll worker workforce gap? So can furloughed state employees be utilized here? Uh, even more complicated or can we use the National Guard here because governors have issued executive orders to use them for contact tracing. Um, you know, in the primaries, we saw several governors use their executive authority to release uh, EOs to move to vote by mail and it was a very bipartisan mix. So I don't think we have answers to all the questions that I've raised now, but we're thinking about it, especially as governors are increasingly being pulled into election litigation. Thank you both. Um, as a reminder to all of our guests, you're welcome to ask questions in the Q&A um, block or through the chat. Um, we have a question here from uh, Matthew Well. Uh, electronic poll books have been cited so far this year for contributing to lines in some jurisdictions, including in Los Angeles. However, paper poll books have significant weaknesses, especially in jurisdictions seeing huge increases in voting by mail, like in Philadelphia. What are the ways for jurisdictions to use electronic poll books safely and, and securely? Anyone like to weigh in on that? I mean, from my perspective, that was going to be my answer to Jennifer Fernick's question. I'd love to see some more research on the security of e-poll books. And um, fortunately, we did just see an announcement that CIS is tackling this. So um, that's probably a very poor answer, and I'll let Jeff Hillbox said. <laughs> so uh, we definitely wanted to build resilience into the use of e-poll books. Uh, they're, uh, they're, they, all, they obviously drive an efficiency in the process, uh, depending on the state policy environment, whether they're uh, always on connected, uh, whether they're networked to, to other communities to help reduce any, uh, any type of uh, attempts uh, uh, or confusion from uh, uh, being at the wrong polling location. Uh, but we are very, we are very clear in the need to back up this information uh, and the need to train on the use of e-poll books. One of the things that we've seen as that training has gone down uh, as people have moved to a remote environment, or it, it may not be the quantity of training, but the effectiveness of uh, training on new equipment. If people are using new e-poll books, if people are using new voting systems, if they aren't out uh, touching the machines, learning the machines, uh, operating the machines in short order before the election, uh, then that there's more, pot more potential for, uh, for long lines or, or any type of delays in the system. And just to add what the, to what the other two have said and mostly just agree, um, e-poll books, as Jeff said, they add additional options for adding efficiency, adding flexibility for your voters, um, being able to facilitate same day voter registration as an example. Um, as with most things in election security, we really focus on resilience. And so having 
paper backups when that's possible with your practices, having different types of backups, training your poll workers on what to do if something goes wrong. Um, and, and as Jeff mentioned, poll worker training with the use of e-poll books is a big issue that a lot of folks have been focused on. And in this, this year where we have a lot of new poll workers where um, our typical poll worker demographic, which is, you know, frankly, a much older crowd um, than we'll have this year because of COVID, because of older Americans being in the highest risk category. There's going to be, there are a lot of training implications for poll workers and, you know, teaching them how to use e-poll poll books correctly is just one of those implications. Your answers lead into a couple of the questions that have been asked in the, the chat here by um, Peter Yasella. Um, do our, can anyone speak to some of the challenges that were experienced in Los Angeles's um, primary with the significant investment um, and design voting machines that um, have been reported to have some operational failures? And, and also a, a secondary question from Peter is that um, in Georgia, there was a long lines and there's some um, view that it was the, the, fit, the, the fault of volunteers not showing up who's taking responsibility for these types of failures if it re relates to you know, long lines and challenges with getting volunteers? So as for Los Angeles, I, I don't want to weigh in on that. I would prefer the, that they weigh in on that. Um, as for long lines and a lot of the challenges we're see we've seen in the primaries during the pandemic, um, there's they're shared responsibility, right? And it, it differs from state to state. I think what's important, most important, is that the states are constantly sharing information after a primary happens. NAS, for example, holds weekly calls with all of our secretaries and their staff who hold elections where we can talk about what went right, what went wrong, and what folks can proactively do to prevent some of the challenges that others may have faced. Um, long lines are, are a reason, especially in terms of COVID, are a reason that a lot of election officials are encouraging their voters to vote by mail or to early vote so that we don't have long lines where it's very difficult to social distance on election day. Um, and, and the poll worker challenge is certainly a valid one. So we, we certainly in, in several states have seen primaries where um, people who were originally planning to be a poll worker either had to back out of being a poll worker because of being in a high risk health category or didn't show up. And so, you know, states have had to at the last minute recruit poll workers through innovative methods. Um, some have, as Maggie mentioned, even called on the National Guard, worked with their governors to do that. Um, and so I, I think forward looking, recruiting poll workers in innovative ways is something that a lot of the states are focused on doing. Nebraska partnered with a couple of associations in their state, um, Ohio did as well, to try to recruit poll workers through different methods than we already are recruiting them. Working with an association for realtors or for um, attorneys or for teachers, for example, to try to recruit new, new poll workers. Um, I say it on every panel I sit on, anyone on the audience, if you wanna look for a way to help make elections run more smoothly in November, sign up to be a poll worker, encourage other people you know to sign up to be a poll worker. It's going to be vitally important. I'd add to that, as someone who comes from the like Homeland Security Emergency Management background, it's of course important to learn the lessons learned, but at the same time, you know, it is, like Lindsay mentioned, so important to kind of focus on the future. And so um, the sooner these conversations can be happening so that there aren't court cases happening the day before, um, the sooner we can figure out backup contingencies for every part of the uh, infrastructure, the sooner we can figure out not only uh, the primary folks who might be working on the polls, but everybody who might be, need to be a backup to call out, the better we'll all be. So um, for our folks, I think um, you know, we're not the IT, uh, sorry, the infrastructure owners again, but um, we want to be kind of doing whatever we can to really support the secretaries of state and the state election directors in building those redundancies. Another question we have here in the, the chat is uh, from Matthew asking about as the as we shift to more widespread absentee balloting and voting by mail, it's likely that that will lead to uh, delays in election counting and we may not have results on election night as we are accustomed to. Uh, can any of you speak to 
know, the challenges we face there um, in terms of you know, public confidence in the election and you know, what may happen the day after uh, that Tuesday in November? Yeah, a big thing that we're, our members are discussing on these calls that I mentioned and through other forums is voter education. Uh, voter education is important every election cycle, but it's extremely important this election cycle when operations are changing. Um, sometimes operations are changing closer to election day than we'd like them to be. Um, and, and that certainly as vote by mail or expanded absentee voting happens in more states, um, we are going to see slower results, slower, tabula so, slower results coming in from the states. And that is something where election officials are talking about now, how to manage expectations around that for their voters. We actually had a conversation about just this on our last, on last week's election committee call. The more votes that come in by mail, probably the later we're going to have results. And so it's really a voter education thing, um, helping people understand that just because we may not know who the president of the United States is on election night or even the next day, or maybe even the day after that, um, that, that doesn't mean something went wrong. We need, so we're focused on how to educate them on how that process is going to unfold, why it may take longer for results to be reported, especially official or especially results from the chief election officials. And um, that's something we need to be doing now. And everybody who has an audience um, of voters, that, that's a really important thing to be talking about. A question that I have involves the resources that are available to the states and the election directors. Over the past few years, uh, Congress has appropriated more than a billion dollars uh, for election administration through uh, the HAVA Act. Uh, as we're now approaching the November elections five months away, what do you see in terms of resource needs that are out there? Um, is more funding needed or is there, um, has currently available funding been spent? What's the picture from the states? Well, I think states are all in a really tough budget climates. So um, one thing that's gonna be really challenging with the most recent EAC injection that came out um, due to coronavirus is just the match. Um, so it's something I think we're really kind of focused on educating our members about because um, you know you have to kind of wonder what, what the purpose of a match is. Is it to have states kind of have skin in the game, in which case it makes a lot of sense, um, or is it to kind of keep people from being able to access funds just because of the tough budgetary climate we're in? So, um, so I would say, first off, I think um, there's some you know under lack of understanding about this too because in some cases, you know, state legislatures need to approve funds that are accessed from the federal government before people can even tap into it. So, you know, one common complaint I think we hear sometimes from the states is, um, you know, people are saying we haven't accessed our funds, but we're not legally allowed to, and uh, we were told to plan for a certain, you know, period of time, so we didn't want to spend 100% of it within six months. So, um, I do think that there is some kind of education that can happen around state funds, and um, just based off of what we're seeing now in terms of states having to choose between you know, do we want to provide additional Medicaid benefits? Do we want to um, provide SNAP to people? Um, they're furloughing state workers. Um, it's just really important to understand the budgetary climate everybody's in. Do you agree with that, Lindsay? Yeah, I mean, NAS, so NAS does have a position related to election security funding from the federal government, which is that we need stable, we support stable federal funding to, to supplement state funding for election security. And the stable part of that is key. The states, um, they want to, so our, our Secretary of State from Minnesota now famously has said election security is a race without a finish line. I say famously because now every secretary and a lot of other folks use that line, but it's very true. It's about managing risk long term and um, reacting to an evolving threat landscape. And so um, states want to use the money well, the election security money, and not spend it as quickly as possible, like they're getting some pressure to do. And so when it comes to election security funding, they're planning how to use those funds over many years. Uh, an example I often give are state cyber navigator programs. Those have been identified by many groups as one of the most important things states can do. Um, it, because that's a program where they support their locals with election cybersecurity. So it's not just 
state changes and state improvements. It's having going out and having state employees have boots on the ground in these 8,000 local election jurisdictions. While funding a cyber navigator program, that's a long-term thing. You're funding staff, you're funding travel, you're funding new initiatives for that program, hopefully for the long run. And so um, states aren't spending all the money right away because they're planning for it over many years when it comes to election security. And, and really that's why they want a stable injection of funds from Congress that they can plan for and know how much it's going to be and when it's going to come. Uh, we don't have a position, NAS, on the most recent funding. Uh, I know many secretaries have encouraged members of Congress that the match requirement is very difficult. And um, if there's a way to get rid of the match, I, I'm, I know many states have encouraged their, their members of Congress to help them with that. But beyond that, we have what we have right now. And so the states are talking about how to best use that what um, what funds can be used to meet that match requirement so that they can take advantage of this funding. And it may not be as relevant for 2020, but one change going forward is that um, Homeland Security grants administered through FEMA, you know, now do have a requirement for election security projects. So I think one thing that both Lindsay and I can do is to really um, find projects where there's economies of scale. So. Um, you know, she mentioned the Cyber Navigator Program. We're particularly proud of that one because I think it's a great example of how a governor's office and a state board of election partnered together. Um, you know, a lot of the navigators are housed under the state CISA there. Um, and so, you know, we're seeing a lot of incidental benefits where that's not just directly impacting the elections community, that's improving local cybersecurity in general and building trust so that when there are non-election cyber incidents, those uh, kind of trusted relationships and reporting mechanisms are already established. Thank you both. We're nearing the end of our hour. I wanted to see if each of you could provide any new parting thoughts um, and particularly any other recommendations that you uh, would like to share with our community of technologists around the country who are interested in, in this issue and seeing where they can make a difference. Well, thanks for that. First off, I um, really love it when people come to us saying, how can we help? Um, that's really, I think, some very heartwarming uh, things uh, for folks who really want to be focused on state cyber government. You know. I think like you mentioned, I'm a, I'm a lawyer uh, by training and so we have pro bono requirements. I'd love to see more of that in tech. Um, and especially now that we're at a time of real activism. Um, so I don't want to dissuade folks from volunteering at a food bank, but um, think about you know the words of Liam Neeson, you have a very specialized set of skills. Um, so during COVID, I think one thing that we saw that was great, you know. U.S. digital response set up and went into kind of rapidly deploy technologists to help out state governments that things like, okay, you know, your unemployment benefits that were built using COBOL, um, you could really kind of bring the best minds in tech to help volunteer with that. Um, so there's a lot of ways to get involved. Um, one plug I have is, you know, if you're at all inclined towards the military, the National Guard really does need cyber professionals to bolster their forces and they are being used to um, uh, in election resilience efforts. So if you can either join a guard or enable it in your work environment that your employees can, that's a great way to get involved. Um, of course, not everybody's sort of military inclined. So I did mention, um, you know, there are some models of the US digital response that have stood up during COVID, but there are states that have institutionalized that. So there are a couple of states around the country that really do utilize cyber volunteers. You know, Michigan has a civilian corps, Wisconsin, Louisiana, um, it's a great way to help out when there's a problem. And it also, if you are a newer, newer cyber professional, um, they provide you with training, hands-on training, but also sort of more formalized training to an incident response. Um, there are some states, I think, in, in Delaware specifically, they have a coordinated vulnerability disclosure program. And I, I do see that kind of being a trend that states are gonna be starting to employ more and more. So not as cool as, you know, getting a couple thousand bucks from like a bug crowd, but at the end of the day, um, We'd really love to see kind of that spirit of pro bono for the tech community really going to help state and local government. I'll echo a lot of um, the, the things that Maggie said. You know, just for closing remarks, I, I just want folks to know that although COVID-19's impacts on election administration has um, taken over much of the national conversation, secretaries of state, election officials, their staffs, or remain very focused on election security. And we remain focused as a community on how to imp share information. We haven't slowed down information sharing through the 
um, government coordinating council through our, comp you know, NASA's relationship with CISA through the EII SAC. Um, NASA has really picked up regular conversation amongst our IT and cybersecurity folks. There are states looking for innovative ways to share information. Um, Ohio, for example, has started um, constantly feeding information to CISA and the EII SAC through suspicious activity reports that is not the type of information you'd usually be reporting, but just the more information sharing, the better. And we're, we're continually focused on this. Um, the secretaries have robust teams in their states who, who have stayed focused on cybersecurity throughout the pandemic. Um, things that tech organizations can do. I actually kind of crowdsourced the answer to this question from our NAS tech group. And so a couple of things that they mentioned are, if you do any monitoring for mis disinformation, for influence operations, cyber threats, um, cyber incidents, look for ways that you can share that information with state election officials, with other SLTT government partners. CISA is a great way that you can do that. They're always willing to partner with folks to help our, our stakeholders get more information. Um, partnering directly with states and localities, as Maggie mentioned, many states are looking to launch vulnerability management programs and they're looking for help from the tech industry and the best ways to do that. Um, if you have an audience, educate your audience on disinformation, on getting their information from their trusted sources, from election officials, on um, deep fakes and emerging threats, uh, and free and discounted services. Several tech companies have partnered with states and localities to offer free and discounted services that have been really effective. My advice to you there would be reach out to some election officials and, and see what their particular needs are in that area. And lastly, sign up to be a poll worker. If you have, if you run a company where um, you can have your employees sign up to be poll workers as well, great thing to encourage them to do. Thanks for having me, Dan. Thank you, Lindsay. Jeff, any concluding thoughts? Well, first, uh, thank you for having me again. Uh, and uh, Maggie and Lindsay were, were right on, uh, particularly about the, the vulnerability disclosure programs and, and assisting in vulnerability management. Uh, when I first uh, was exposed to this sector, uh, people characterized a, a history of um, hostility between vulnerability management and the election community. And I wouldn't characterize it like that uh, anymore. It's not what I've seen. Uh, the secretaries of state shops, the local election officials, the, uh, the state election directors have all developed uh, more mature, uh, kind of robust cyber shops trying to, to intake, to ingest information, as much information as possible, be it uh, on hybrid attacks through information operations, be it on, on direct cyber attacks. They're looking for uh, the most valuable information you can provide, and oftentimes for technologists, uh, it is the, the services that they can provide. I'd also want to highlight another key audience here, uh, and that is that of like state legislatures uh, who have a, a strong impact on this community uh, and, and their ability to help them educate, uh, to help educate them on, on the particular uh, laydowns of, of election security and, and many of the resources that they have uh, and help them make good policy decisions with their state election director, with their state election officials. That's a great recommendation. Thank you. We are out of time. Uh, I'd like to close by thanking all of our panelists for their time and their thoughtful perspectives. I know each of you are very busy, um, so we're very grateful that you were able to spend part of your afternoon with us. And I'd also like to thank everyone joining us today. Uh, the Lincoln Network will be holding uh, future discussions on election security and cybersecurity in the weeks ahead. Uh, please stay tuned for our future invitations, including a discussion next week with Congress, Congressman Rodney Davis from Illinois, the ranking member of the House Committee on Administration. Uh, thank you again all for your time, and we hope you will be joining us again soon.